Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Crucible by Arthur Miller. So, going into this, I have actually read Death of a Salesman, I think, although I don't really remember it. Mostly what I knew about Arthur Miller was that he was once married to Marilyn Monroe, which makes a refreshing change for, like, a male in the public eye, for me to, or for people in general, just to know them as the husband of somebody else, you know? Because normally it's the other way around, you see in the headlines, like, you know, wife of NBA star wins Olympic gold medal, and it's like, you mean Olympic gold medalist wins, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna read you the blurb, then I'm gonna go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say, when I bought this, I got this from a charity shop, I popped it on my Instagram, and my friend Charlie, shout out to Charlie, sent me a message saying uh, it was one of her favorite ever plays. I've also literally just had a message from my friend Subi, who runs the drama group at Wickham Art Center, saying that it's a great play as well. And I was like, yeah, I've actually just finished reading it, and I agree with you. So uh, yeah, anyway. Dane reads. Arthur Miller's classic parable of mass hysteria draws a chilling parallel between the Salem witch hunt of 1692, one of the strangest and most awful chapters in human history, and the McCarthyism which gripped America in the 1950s. The story of how the small community of Salem is stirred into madness by superstition, paranoia and malice, culminating in a violent climax, is a savage attack on the evils of mindless persecution and the terrifying power of false accusations. So, with that in mind, let's go in and take a look. A lot of this is going to be dialogue that I've highlighted. Um, I mean, I think most people are fairly familiar with the story of the Salem Witch Trials, or at least they know the gist. Um, Miller also said, obviously, while there were historical records that he could draw on, there's not necessarily that much information on the individual character of the people involved, so he did have to take some liberties. He also has some like paragraphs um, that are like his notes, essentially, on who these people are. The, they kind of interrupt the flow of the play, but obviously if you were to go and see the play performed, you wouldn't just get somebody reading that out to you, you know, you just see the play. Um, and actually, I think it added to it as a reading experience. Anyway. Oh, okay, so there's a character called Ruth, and my boss at the art centre is called Ruth. So Mercy says, have you tried beating her? I gave Ruth a good one and it waked her for a minute, because obviously... She's in an unnatural sleep. She was dancing in the woods and then she went into an unnatural sleep. So it's got to be the devil and witches and shit. And so uh, Mary Warren here, she, she says, Abby, we've got to tell. Witchery's a hanging error. A hanging like they'd done in Boston two years ago. We must tell the truth, Abby. You'll only be whipped for dancing and the other things. And this great little one-two between Mary Warren and the Proctor. So Mary Warren goes, I only come to see the great doings in the world. And the Proctor says, I'll show you a great doing on your ass one of these days. Now get you home, my wife is waiting with your work. It was a different time. And so I wanted just to read you one of these uh, sort of lengthier prose periods where it talks about one of the characters. And uh, this one was one of the more interesting ones. Uh, especially because of the way it's done. So uh, we've got stage directions. Everything is quiet. Rebecca walks across the room to the bed. Gentleness exudes from her. Betty is quietly whimpering, eyes shut. Rebecca simply stands over the child who gradually quiets. And then we go over to, and while they're so absorbed, we may put a word in for Rebecca. Rebecca was the wife of Francis Nurse who, from all accounts, was one of those men for whom both sides of the argument had to have respect. He was called upon to arbitrate disputes as though he were an unofficial judge, and Rebecca also enjoyed the high opinion most people had for him. By the time of the delusion they had 300 acres, and their children were settled in separate homesteads within the same estate. However, Francis had originally rented the land, and one theory has it that, as he gradually paid for it and raised his social status, there were those who resented his rise. Another suggestion to explain the systematic campaign against Rebecca, and inferentially against Francis, is the land war he fought with his neighbours, one of whom was a Putnam. This squabble grew to the proportions of a battle in the woods between partisans of both sides, and it is said to have lasted for two days. As for Rebecca herself, the general opinion of her character was so high that to explain how anyone dared cry her out for a witch, and more, how adults could bring themselves to lay hands on her, we must look to the fields and boundaries of that time. As we have seen, Thomas Putnam's man for the Salem Ministry was Bailey, the nurse clan had been in the faction that prevented Bailey's taking office. In addition, certain families allied to the nurses by blood or friendship, and whose farms were contiguous with a nurse farm or close to it, combined to break away from the Salem Town Authority and set up Topsfield, a new and independent entity whose existence was resented by old Salemites. Though the guiding hand behind the outcry was Putnam's is indicated by the fact that, as soon as it began, this Topsfield nurse faction absented themselves from church in protest and disbelief. It was Edward and Jonathan Putnam who signed the first complaint against Rebecca, and Thomas Putnam's little daughter was the one who fell into a fit at the hearing and pointed to Rebecca as her attacker. To top it all, Mrs Putnam, who was now staring at the bewitched child on the bed, 
soon accused Rebecca Spirit of tempting her to iniquity, a charge that had more truth in it than Mrs Putnam could know. Putnam, great quote, I'm sick of meetings, cannot the man turn his head without he having a meeting? If you ever worked in an office, you'll relate hard to that. And this is a great quote, and that, this is one I want to remember for when, um, so I'm moving soon, and so I've got like boxes and boxes of books, and uh, we get, he appears loaded down with half a dozen heavy books. Hale says, pray you, someone take these. Paris says, Mr. Hale, oh, it's good to see you again. My, they're heavy. And then Hale says, they must be, they are weighted with authority. So I'm now going to say that if anyone comments on how heavy my books are when I move. And so here we get part of like this hearing, I suppose, about it. And we get Hawthorne, he says, Now, Martha Corey, there is abundant evidence in our hands to show that you have given yourself to the reading of fortunes. Do you deny it? And Martha says, I'm innocent to a witch. I know not what a witch is. How do you know then that you are not a witch? If I were, I would know it. Yeah, this seems fair. All right, I believe it. And then Giles, he goes, a fart on Thomas Putnam. That is what I say to that. So again, lots of great lines. The story in itself, I mean, I'm reasonably familiar with the Salem witch trials. Um, so I kind of knew the generals of it. So it's nice to go and see some more specifics. And again, not only the, like, the rear says that there's like parallels between this and uh, McCarthyism, but there's basically this between this and any witch hunt that you see like on social media and stuff. Um, so arguably, it's arguably more relevant today. It looks a lot about this like mass hysteria and how, you know, we all gang up on people. So yeah, The Crucible by Arthur Miller. Very strong read. I get this a 4.5 out of 5. The only recent play that I've read that, you know, is anywhere near as good as this would be uh, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof by Tennessee Williams. That was also fantastic. Either of those two I'd love to go and see performed, but I think I'd like to see this performed most of all. So I might keep my eyes peeled now that the world's opening up again. Maybe I'll get to go and see it. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Crucible by Arthur Miller. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.